There he is. Thank you for your patience, love. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I don't know if you've been keeping up with the stream. We are over $7,500 raised for charity so far for Gamer That's X. awesome. Oh and... my God, that's so great. <laughs> and our goal was 2000 which we met in the first 10 minutes. That's so, so brilliant. <laughs> Oh, he's got to go change his cosplay. He's doing, he's changing his cosplay every hour. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, we, we've had some, some interviews, we've played some games, and now we're going to settle in for a Q&A and also woes and tales of Hollywood. Um, <laughs> An hour long of complete bitterness. <laughs> As well as, as talking about some of the things that we have worked on together in the past, of which there are uh, numerous things. Let me get my chat set up. Um, Zoom is like being kind of temperamental right now. Let me see. Um, but yeah, just to remind everybody in the chat, um, Michael played Parker, Detroit Evolution, who is our angry Jericho android, um, and also was in Live Scream and also was in Devil's Advocate, uh, which are pre two previous films that uh, we've worked on together, and uh, has also been on some on television shows and, and movies and stuff like Valor, um, which was on CBS, I believe. Um, so he's he's been in uh, a professional actor for over 20 years now, has a lot of experience, has a lot of stories good and bad about the industry um, so if you want to ask questions about acting any of the roles that he's worked for for me any future things uh, any any life experience or hot tea uh, just leave it in the chat and the mods will relay that uh, and, and hold on to that for us and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well everything seems pretty tame so I should be able to to keep up with everybody although you know everybody calling you angry robot boy is, <laughs> is, is is now your handle i suppose um and, and just to remind chat as well we do have one more milestone to uh to get to um which is ten thousand dollars if we reach ten thousand dollars today which we are uh, twenty four hundred dollars away from now uh, right now i will shave the side of my head so that's if you want to see me Ooh. shave the side of my head and start rocking some mad max look uh that will that that'll be our goal for the end of the stream Oh, God, please donate. <laughs> um, Lone Lion actually has a question for you right out the gate. Um, how is Woofed going? Ah, Woofed. Yes, it's going pretty good. I was going to try to film it in uh, actually next weekend, but um, my uh, DP uh, had a work conflict, so we actually had to move to August. So, but it's going good. It got, um, I submitted the script into some festivals, it got into Crimson um so that's that's good and yeah that's about where we are with it just kind of still waiting to, to film it now, I'm is, doing... is is that the script that you were telling me about at genre blast last year about the one night stand with the younger guy that ends up becoming uh creepy yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so please tell me i please walk me through the inspir the, the inspiration for this in real life and, and, and how it translated to, and, this, and the script that it translates to, because I haven't read the script yet, so I don't know what, yeah, where, know. where this project is. I just remember you telling me about this experience at Genre Blast. Everyone's been like, is that the hookup that you had that you were telling us about? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, God. Uh, so I was um, online on a dating app, and uh, this really cute guy uh, woofed me. And um, so we started talking. Wait, okay, and, wait, so define that for me. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> so in, <laughs> in the, God, I'm like really talking about this. Okay, in, in the app, um, on the app for Scruff, there's an app called Scruff. Oh. If you like some, yes, if you like somebody, you woof them. Okay, so, it's like yeah. swiping right. Yes, exactly. Okay. But yeah, but um, yeah. So, in like in like sort of like the bear, wolf, hairy guy, gay culture, there's like wolves and gurs and kind of stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So he woofed me, and uh, and so we started talking a little bit, and we um, planned to hook up, and uh, and so like. You know, start out really cool and like really like you know oh blah 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 and so um, he was like uh, you know can you come by to my place and I was like 
yeah, sure. He's like, cool. The only problem is, is that I live with my parents. And I was like, okay. And, uh, and he's, and by the way, he was 40. He was, he, oh, so he, he's, so he's he around wasn't my a millennial. I, I always pictured him as like 21. No, no, no. He was my age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so we, um, you know, we kept talking back and forth and, he, and I'm like, okay, so you live with your parents. Okay. And he's like, yeah, I take care of them. Uh, my mom has dementia and my dad's going through like chemotherapy. And I was like, oh, that's really sweet. You know, and he's like, yeah, and my room's on the other side of the house. So it won't be a big deal for noise. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I'm telling the story. So, um, <laughs> so, um, we, so it, you know, we kept communicating and it was going to be like, yeah, can you meet me um, at like seven o'clock? And I was like, sure. And so then I got another uh, message and it was like, hey, um, I, my, I don't want my parents to know that we're actually hooking up. So do you mind if you if I give you like show you a map of the street and where to park at? And I was like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> and so he did. And I was like, cool. And he was like, yeah, and can we do like eight o'clock? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. He was a I, he was super, super cute. And that's why I was going along <laughs> with this, FYI. Like, it was like, you know. So, um, so you know, 8.30 rolled around, and I started driving there, and I got a, I got a call from him. And I was like, hey. And, uh, I mean, I was like, hey, what's up? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> hey, how's it, how's it going, man? And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, hey, yeah, um, listen, do you mind um, actually parking um, behind the Doshers and I'll meet you at your car there? And I was like, okay. He's like, yeah. Weirder and weirder. I know, I know. And he's like, it's just, um, I'm really nervous about my parents finding out. And I was like, okay, yeah, um, sure. <laughs> so um, I, I like literally was talking to myself the whole time going, really, are you really doing this right now? <laughs> this desperate, but he's really cute, you know? And so... <laughs> This is, I mean, yeah. And so, uh, parked behind Doshers, sat. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like telling the story how pathetic I am. So I sat in the parking lot for like 20 minutes waiting for him. And I was like behind Doshers. So it was pitch black dark behind Doshers. Is this West Ashley? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It gets it gets worse. It gets worse. So so I'm sitting there going, okay, this is really weird. Like, is he like normal? Is this a, like is this a normal person? You know. And then so part of me was like, well, now I just got to kind of find out what's going on with this is guy. He even gay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, I'm texting him like, hey, are you coming? Like, what's the deal? And so he's like, yeah, sorry, um, I'm, I'm almost there. And so he comes out and he's like super cute. And uh, like he gets in the car, he's like, yeah, hey, I'm so sorry, um, uh, all that stuff. And I was like, that's okay. And then he, we made out and I was like, totally fine. Um, <laughs> erased, yeah. And uh, he's like, and I was like, well, why don't we just walk to your house from here instead of like dealing with the parking situation? He's like, okay. And so we walked along, we had to walk along the Greenway, which is like this like long path in Charleston that's super kind of wooded and dark. So we're walking along there. And while we're walking, we're having like, you know, normal conversation, like, you know, where'd you go to school, this, this, and that. And like, we actually knew some people in common. So that made me feel better. But the whole time we were talking, he kept looking behind his back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the chat right now. Becky Hill in infomercial voice. But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's going desperate, desperate. <laughs> so um, so we're walking and he's looking behind his back and I'm like start to like be like doing it too. And I'm like, <laughs> is everything okay? And he's like, yeah, he's like, um, I'll tell you when we get out of here. And I was like, okay. And so, and not yeah, if. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we get out of the greenway and we're walking on the street and like, he's like, yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you knew, but there was like an old uh, railroad back there. And I was like, oh, I think I remember hearing that. He's like, yeah. And actually a couple years ago, a girl was actually raped back there. So it gives me the creeps. And I was like, oh God, that's awful. He's like, yeah. So whenever I go back there, I just kind of get nervous. And I was like, yeah, that's horrible. Um, 
So we kept walking and um, he's like, I'm really sorry about all this. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. Like, you know, it's kind of fun. It's like, I feel like I'm in high school again, you know? And not and, a uh, horror movie at all. <laughs> <laughs> not a horror movie. So um, we proceed to walk to his house and he stops us. And I see the house and they have like a big bay window in the house and it's covered by a curtain. And he's like, hold on. He's like, I think I see my dad peeking out of the window. And I was like, okay. And he's like, do you mind if we walk by the house a couple of times? I have to keep, re- I have to keep emphasizing this guy was super, super cute. <laughs> Which made the casting of the movie so important for you guys to believe that I would actually keep going on with this. <laughs> so, so uh, we um, go past the house a couple times and he's like, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going <laughs> to... We're gonna go through and go through my bedroom window. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's like I'm in high school again. And so he's also 40. We're both 40. Both 40 doing this. Yeah. Um, so go, go through the window. And by I have to tell you, by this point, I was I was really like I, it hit me in my head. I was like, this would make a good script. So I definitely have to keep going to see what's going to happen. <laughs> I need to know how the story ends. <laughs> yeah, totally. this is totally it. This is how I suffer from my art. So, <laughs> so I go into the room and we start, you know, whatever, making out and stuff like that. And he's, he goes, oh my gosh, wait. And I was like, and it's, oh, by the way, it's pitch black in the room. Pitch black, pitch black dark, can't see a thing. Because you couldn't turn on the light or else the parents would know. Yeah. <laughs> So he stands by the door and starts listening. And uh, and he's like, shh. And so we're sitting there in quiet. And in my head, I'm going, okay, he's either going to start stabbing me with a knife or someone's going to jump out of the closet and start stabbing me. You know, and I was like, I'm <laughs> again going, this is such, so far, this is a really good script so far. <laughs> so- <laughs> I'm so invested in this, in this terrible situation in my own life. <laughs> so um he's like okay we go back at it whatever and then he gets up again and like he ends up like standing up he, he, he goes shh, shh, shh. and he stands up and i just see his shadow and his shadow just goes down to the ground and um and this is when i kind of start like i grab my i actually grabbed my keys and made like a fist you know with a key and like i put my blanket over me because i was like is he gonna like i really didn't know what he was gonna do Still going, this is going to be a really great script. (laughs) He comes back up and he's like listening through under the door. And, and so finally I was like, okay, I was like, listen, I should probably go. Like, this is like, you know, kind of weird. And he's like, yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't mean for it to be uh, so odd. And I was like, it's, it's, it's fine. And so I got out and then, um, you got out how? I got out through the window. (laughs) So, I mean, it's where I came in. <laughs> and so I got out the window and, um, and then waited outside for a little bit and, like, started walking back to the car. And he basically walked me back to the car. And, I mean, in real life, we actually ended up going back to my place and hooking up and all was fine. But in the <laughs> script, it turns different. So it has right. a different meaning. Yeah. And that's, that's fantastic. I, I, I can't wait to read that and see what you ended up doing with it. No, I have to yeah, I, I remember when we were discussing it on the plane back from Genre Blast, and I was like, oh, there's a million things that could happen in that house. Fantastic. And it did go to Crimson and, and became a finalist um, in yes. their script contest, and, and that's really awesome. And so who did you end up casting as your uh, your love interest? So I wanted to cast um, gay actors mm-hmm. to play the gay characters, and I actually had a really hard time finding a local... Um, I mean, I know gay actors here, but like they were just too young. Um, like Maximilian, like came up, but he's just he was just too young for the part. Um, and um, and then I got um, I asked my agent, and she sent me a couple people, and they just didn't like I needed them to be like scruffy looking, you know. And um, and so I ended up casting a friend of mine in Los Angeles, um, who's going to play the part. So and he's he's totally perfect for it. Awesome. Tony Sago is his name. Cool, cool, cool. I'll yes, and he's actually, so he's actually um, uh, the character in Mulan. That's the um, like the love interest in Mulan. He's um, that character was drawn after him. Wait, Shang? 
Like yes. In, in the animated, uh, in the animated Mulan. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, the body to... Yeah, because I know back in the '90s, you know, when they would do 2D animation, they would kind of have like physical people that they would base the character. That's a that's so so. Li Shang is your uh, is your love interest. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's the thing in it. <laughs> Everybody's just like, oh damn, he is hot in the in the, in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, he's he like, see that? Cute or it doesn't work. Oh, yeah, clearly that has to be <laughs> motivation. And I was like, I was like, you know, there's going to be a lot of making out in this movie, so just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm really excited for you moving forward with that because I know uh, we've been working on a movie together for ever <laughs> called Fame Patel, which yeah. is also inspired by your life, which you, you wrote. Um, and that is a, a also a horror movie, a horror comedy um, that is about uh, your, more about your experience as an actor um, yes. and, and the dealing with rejection, dealing with typecasting, dealing with uh, cruelty in the industry and stuff. Uh, and, and also dealing with uh, the horror community because it's an actor who goes to a horror convention and, and meets some indie filmmakers and stuff and has a little bit of a disagreement with some of the things that they say to him. Um, I'm really excited about this. I am the director and, and uh, producer of it. I've become the producer sort of <laughs> by necessity. Um, but uh, I, I'm really excited to get to it eventually. We have raised, I think, a, a good bit of money for it. It's just now we were going to make it and then COVID happened. So it's just, it's constantly always been this thing. We were going to make it after Detroit Evolution, but then it was too close together and I was falling apart. So uh, we've, mm -hmm. we've had to push it a couple times, but uh, when we finally get that made, it'll be fantastic. And uh, I, I think uh, originally for that movie, we were going to go very 80s with it. But I think we talked about maybe pulling back on that a little bit. Yeah, we did, I think, just because we've been seeing so much of that going on. Um, so just to be a little, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Go ahead. In the, in the, in the chat, it says, Fame Patel sounds awesome. Yes, it, it's, it is a, I would say it's a gay actor revenge fantasy in a lot of, <laughs> it, it is succinctly summed up. Um, in terms of like, uh, cause you've gone through a lot in, in your career with, um, you, I think you've gone through multiple agents. I think you've done literally thousands of auditions. Um, you've dealt with acceptance and rejection as all actors do. And, um, what, what do you think are some of the challenges that inspired Fame Fatale? Not just from like the literal, like experience you had at the convention that, that informed the plot, but as far as like the things that are informing that character and, inf and, and all the things that come before the movie that lead to him kind of, kind of reaching that breaking point. Yeah, well, I write, um, I mean, I think that was my first script and I was telling people the story of that and they were like, oh my God, that would be such a good script to write. And um, so I really like just kind of wrote it from, I mean, everything I write is basically like my life experience. Um, I just, it's very cathartic for me. Um, and, you know, I like, like you said, I've been acting since I graduated high school in 96 and went to school in New York for musical theater, um, 97, 98. And like at that time, um, it was very like old school uh, kind of training. Like they break you down and build you back up. But the problem with me is that, you know, I, I had a really low self-esteem in high school. Like I was super overweight and, um, and acting and singing were like my things that made me like have friends and popular. And so when I went to the school, they like, tore that down for me. And they're like, oh, we're gonna build you back up. And I'm like, well, I'm already way down now. Um, so it just took a while to to kind of get out of that slump of like, you know, cause it's, it's it, and, and where I went to school was AMDA, the American Musical Dramatic Academy. And it was mostly taught by dancers, a lot of the classes and, and dancers, like dance training is really intense, especially back then. You know, it's kind of stuff like, you know, if you get the step, like if, like, Rockhead stories like if a rockhead like got the step wrong and another rockhead was near them they push him down into the pit you know kind of stuff like, if you're not prepared you might as well leave you know just very like you have to wear red lipstick you have to do this you have to you know very like you know hard um so that's sort of the training i got so i had to spend a lot of time breaking out of that and um and like you know in all my life i wanted to be an actor i wanted to be an actor since i can really remember um and and my and I wanted to go to LA and I always had this envisionment that, you know, all my, my life is going to be so different and, and change and, and be, uh, 
amazing once I got to LA because I'd be discovered. And that's sort of the feeling that everybody feels like, I think, as an actor, they're like, I'm gonna go to LA, I'm gonna get discovered, and this, this, and that. And it's just, it's just not the case. It's just, it's, it's a slow, long, for, for really the, the average actor. Every now and then you'll have the person that wins the lottery and gets booked like that. But it's literally like, you, I mean, the lottery and that are about the same chances. <laughs> for most actors, it's a very tedious, long, drawn out series of no's and no's and no's and no's. And I just, you know, it was, it was rough. I had agents that, you know, my first agent I interviewed with, I was telling him I went to school and, and took ballet. And he said to me, oh God, you and tights? I all can think about the hippopotamus in Fantasia. You know, just stuff like that, you know, and just a lot of like things that like as a young person, I didn't like, I, I didn't know that these people were just jerks and to yeah. not to like go. I, to me, like these were the people that were, that had, they were telling me the truth. You know, it's like, I'm, you know, you, you have the final word on what I'm supposed to be in this life. And, you know, and they're like, oh, well, you're a hippopotamus in Fantasia, you know? <laughs> so it was just a lot of that and a lot of like, um, you know, series of rejections and kind of things like that, that I think I, I, I kind of like, put all those years into that character into just that particular um, part that he's up for. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things you think with um, the horror community, which you you come from as well, you're very, very involved in the horror community. I know Friday the 13th is one of your favorite movies. Um, and, and you've done a lot of horror films specifically. You usually die in them. You're like the <laughs> Sean Bean of Charleston horror. <laughs> Um, which is, oh, which I is, love that. Which is <laughs> great because you don't die in Fame Fatale. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, yeah, a horror film where you don't die. Uh, and you don't die in Detroit Evolution, but it's not a horror film, so it doesn't count. That's true. Um, <laughs> so uh, so, so uh, you, you brought the acting side, you brought that kind of history. What, what kind of informed how you wrote the horror community and the horror side of Fame Fatale um, that ends up happening in that film and your experience there as well? Um, so, well, like you said, I grew up, uh, well, I mean, I've loved horror since I was young too. So, I mean, I think I saw Friday the 13th part two. I was watching that when I came out like maybe two. So I saw that when I was six. Oh my goodness. And, yeah. I mean, I did like, I was the youngest kid and had older brothers and sisters. So I watched all those horror movies with them. So five or six. And like, I remember going to my, uh, God, um, Godfather's uh, funeral and, uh, this lady, and I got into this conversation and I was telling her all about Friday the 13th. <laughs> I was like six <laughs> years funeral. old. She was like, oh my God, this kid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, so particularly for me as a, a gay person, like the women in horror have been a big um, inspiration to me just because they, they overcome all these great obstacles and, and, uh, and I just always have been, I've always admired that. Like, Friday the 13th, I admire Amy Steele so much. She's my number one favorite. Now I'm on Elm Street. I, you know, I love Nancy. And then when I got older, part three came out with, you know, Patricia Arquette and then Lisa Wilcox, all these like badass women that could do gymnastics and fight. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I love these women, you know? Um, so I just, and, and I, it's funny you say what you said about dying because my cousin and I used to always play uh, like Wonder Twins. And so we do like Wonder Twins and my story, I, and every time I played my story, I always had to die at the end of it. And she was always like, why do you have to always die at the end of the story? Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's funny about tragic. Yeah, that's <laughs> why I'm doing it now. It's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so like horror has always been a big part of my life. Um, and just a big escapism and just to be able to like overcome obstacles, you know, cause I always can imagine myself as this character going into like a, a hard life situation. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, when I, so kind of to get personal in this whole process, I am a recovering alcoholic. And so when I was, uh, got sober, I tried, started, started trying to get sober about 10 years ago, I moved back to Charleston and kind of at this point where in my disease, I thought that my whole life was over. Like I had lost my dreams of being an actor, all this, this and that, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't do this cause I couldn't stay sober. And, um, and I finally, you know, got some sobriety and in that moment started meeting people that were filmmakers in Charleston and did horror. And so like, you know, I started meeting people in that, meeting people in this and, and doing this and doing that. And like, it's, you know, and so now it's a really, really, really big part of my life and, and being an actor and everything like that. So 
so yeah so so of course it's going to be a horror movie you know <laughs> i mean it's, it's it's the thing it's like i kind of feel like i don't know like it's horror people are my community you know we're just i think every time i talk to somebody in horror we always have some relating story um that, that we can both be like oh yeah you know that's we kind of went through something together and and horror got it got us out of it especially in the gay community you know because uh we all had trouble with the heart, like especially my, at least my age, um, you know, it was still kind of tough to be gay back then. And like, uh, really tough to be gay back then. And um, like horror was a big escape for us, so. Yeah, I and it's amazing how many uh, gay filmmakers and actors we know in the horror community, uh, Troy Escamilla, uh, Tommy and Ravi, uh, William Stansel, many of them who live here in Charleston. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't realize that until I got into the horror community and started meeting directors and stuff. And they really do become my favorite people because you see kind of like dime a dozen horror bros and whatever making films. Uh, and then, you know, like people like Tommy and Troy and William come out with stuff that's really innovative and, and also does tend to be more diverse and more thoughtful mm -hmm. in some of the ways the characters are treated, uh, especially like Troy with Party Night had a very, very diverse cast, um, which I know that you found really um, remarkable uh, of yeah. the first film. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, and also I, I love the, the love of Mark Patton as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street too, because he gets really involved now in like indie films and stuff um, yeah. as, as like a, a an, an 80s scream queen, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Like, it's really great because I don't think they realize, especially the women in horror, like I think they were just sort of like, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of them were just doing for the work, you know? Um, and, uh, and then, you know, it kind of like, I don't know, it wasn't so popular like in the 90s, you know, and then it kind of like people started going to conventions more. And I think they don't, I think they didn't realize that the influence that they would have on for gay men in, in the world, you know, and so a lot of times, you know, you're telling them and they're just like, oh my God, I had, you know, I had no idea, you know, like Felissa Rose from Sigway Camp, like she's so, like she's living it up with that stuff. Like she's just like so happy and so thrilled that she like could do that for, for gay men. So it's, it's so great to actually see that their reaction to that, you know? Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned Felissa Rose, that reminds me that you were in A Nun's Curse, which is now on, I, I you know what, I was going through Amazon uh, Prime the other night and it was in new releases. And I was like, go Tommy and Ravi, you're in the new releases of Amazon. This is fantastic, they've made it. Um, the A Nun's Curse is our friend Tommy and Ravi, uh, their latest horror film. Felissa Rose stars as an evil nun and uh, Michael uh, has a role in this. So you can check that out on Amazon. I think it's at Walmart, you can get a Blu-ray. Um, there are a lot of other places you can pick that up. It's, but that's probably your most recent film that's come out, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was really cool. Again, again like to emphasize like how the horror community in, in Charleston specifically, like I, 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 it's, I'm just so grateful for it because I had no confidence coming back into the business. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I even wanted to do it anymore. And, um, you know, I, and William Stansel basically took my hand and like brought me into one movie and then, you know, and then you guys just being like, yeah, we want you to be in this. And I was like, oh God, you really, you really want me to be in your movie, you know? And, and you just kind of built up my confidence again and then to start writing. I never thought I would ever write a movie. <laughs> like I remember when Matt Damon and Ben Affleck won for Good Will Hunting and I was like, oh great, now actors have to write their own movies, you know? And I was like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and now I'm doing it, you know? It's like, you know, it's, 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 I cannot, and I mean, I'm, and then now I'm like, I did, I had a scene with Felissa Rose from Sleepaway Camp, one of my like heroes. Oh. I got to act with her, you know? I mean, it's crazy. It's just insane. And that's, that's the Charleston horror community, mm -hmm. you know, because of that. So I'm, I'm forever grateful for this community. I, I, one of my favorite stories about um, you, you being spotted in a Charleston film was uh, when you were at, I think you were at the Chinese theater for a film festival and somebody uh, won live scream at a trivia. <laughs> yes, I was so excited for you. It was not, it was, it was a screening. It was not just a, it was a screening of Nightmare on Elm Street that Heather Langenkamp went to and she has not been to a screening of Nightmare on Elm Street in forever. So it was like an anniversary screening. So it was a big deal. And it was, and literally it was, it was the second, it was a prize for the second question. And the guy goes, guy goes, uh, a live stream is the uh, prize. And I was like, 
that live stream, live stream? <laughs> <laughs> and this girl behind me won it. And I was like, can I see your movie? And it's, so I was like, it was totally live stream. And so I'm like, oh my God, this is my friend's movie. Oh my God, I'm this. this. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited for you. <laughs> she asked to take a picture with you, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I had a whole I had a whole group of people around me that were like, I have little fans. I was so and my friend Tony, that's Tony was with me, that's gonna be in the movie, and he was like, Oh my god. He's like, I've been in LA forever, and like you've been in Charleston house. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, I mean, it, it is amazing. Like we, we, a lot of stuff breaks out of Charleston and um, especially on the indie scene because there's not like a lot of, there's a little bit of stuff going on here like Rough House Productions, Vice Principals, um, Danny um, McBride, uh, his his company is here. So anything that Danny McBride does and, and David Gordon Green does is, is here in Charleston. Um, like the Halloween movies and stuff. But I, uh, I feel like a lot of stuff breaks out from indie here and it's, it is really cool to, to be part of that and to, um, to contribute to that. Um, I had a question in the chat way back. I don't remember who, I, uh, who asked it, but I did hold on to it mentally. Um, in terms of your experience as an actor, uh, have you ever had like a personality conflict or like a fight with somebody like on set and then had to deal with that for the rest of the day? And <laughs> I think the expression says it all. <laughs> and kind of like, how how did you deal with that? Like, how have you dealt with um, like conflicts with, I mean, I, other actors, I su suppose, but also even directors? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm again, I was trained very old school. And I think this is one of the things that I'm very grateful for with that is that I don't, I have a rule that I don't cause problems on sets. Um, because I want to work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I show up on time. I know my lines. If I have a conflict with somebody, um, I, I mean, I'm trying to think if I've really ever had, I'm not a very, like, I don't get really, I don't like confrontation really. So I don't yeah. really get into like tiffs. Um, I think like the, probably the most uncomfortable situation I had that uh, kind of was affecting my performance was when I was in my early twenties, I was doing summer stock in Northern California and they housed us with people. And um, I got housed with this older gay man that kept coming on to me mm. and, and like would wear his robe and he had nothing in it under it. And like, it was just, it was a really uncomfortable situation. And I was too young to really like get out of it. Like I, I was just, I just had, I had no self-confidence and I was, I just didn't understand. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to express myself be like, I'm uncomfortable. I want to leave the situation. So for the whole summer I was with this guy. And so I had to like brush it off and show up for my performances and do my performances, you know, but like, uh, for me, it's just kind of like an old school thing. It's like, you know, you're getting paid to act. So you got it. The second that you're like about to go on stage or the second you're on set, it, whatever your outside issues are, have to go. Even if it's a conflict with the person on the set, mm -hmm. it's got to go. So. Yeah. And, and for, for me, I think um, it, it's always a, a case of, is the person who is usually running the production and, and who, who wants the production more than anybody it's always just like, do I love this movie and what the, and the footage that I'm going to get at the end of this day more than I'm annoyed at that person? And the yeah. answer is all, almost unanimously yes. So that's what I always have to focus on in terms of like, you know, just just putting that aside and being like, all I have to do is get good footage. That's that's the goal. I just have to get good footage and not let any other stuff stand in the way and just also be like, it's just, you know, one day shoot, two day shoot, whatever, like, and then I never have to see them again. <laughs> and so it's like, you also have to cling to that too, especially if you're like a day player. It's like, it's just one day. Just one day, yeah, yeah. And, but, but I will say, and I will, I will say this as an actor, um, like I've, I've, I've worked with emotionally abusive directors before mm -hmm. and that I would say I, there's, there's nothing worth getting emotionally abused by somebody for because it's just, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And I, in, in my younger days, I took a lot of it and I worked with two directors that were, that threw stuff across the room when he got stuff wrong and you know, stuff like that. And so that kind of stuff now I don't tolerate. I'll, I don't care who, I don't care what it is. Well, I mean, if it was like Halloween or something, I'd probably do it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but like small paying theater. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I so. want to acknowledge that we just passed $8,000 in our uh, fundraiser for Gamer X. Thank you, Nicole, for bringing us over 8,000. 10,000 is our head shaving goal. So, you know, we might we might get there by 7 p.m. 
Um, if you have any questions for Michael, feel free to drop them in the chat or drop them in the uh, stream Q&A ask box because I've been monitoring that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about Detroit Evolution specifically, uh, which is uh, what these guys I think know you for uh, the most right now, uh, for now anyway, until until other stuff. Um, so I'm in the Parker cosplay. You are in the Parker cosplay. Just oh, notice you're wearing it. Oh. <laughs> it's hard to see if I'm not in the light. There you go. But yeah, you look good. That's pretty good. Isn't it? I think it's. Wow. It's. I think. I think it's probably shrunk about three times in the wash at this point. Maybe. <laughs> um, but yes. Yeah, so with uh, with Parker, um, the casting process with that was kind of interesting because I that. Sometimes there, I've come to you and I'm like, hey, Michael, I want you to play this part. Um, but I actually made you audition for this because mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't have anybody in mind for it specifically. I just I had the role and I didn't even know. I think that that role was gender um, unbiased. Like I, I, I was seeing men and women for it. Like it was not um, restricted to being male or female. And um, I, I remember though we we were talking because you're like man I, I want in on this Detroit stuff, and uh, and I was trying to think of a role and and I was like uh, I think I, I auditioned you for that and then um, maybe for I think there might have been another role that I you read for, but that one was the main one because as soon as I realized that that role would require you to just berate Michael Smallwood, <laughs> who is your arch nemesis. Yes. I was, <laughs> I was, I was like, oh well, the meta game of this is perfect. Um, but your audition knocked it out of the absolute park. And I remember, mm -hmm. you know, you you talked about how you had done a lot of um, training and stuff and and preparation for that with I think a coach um, before mm -hmm. before doing that audition, and it turned out fantastic. And as soon as I saw your audition, I was was like, oh, this is gonna work perfect. So uh, I think you were the first one that actually got cast from the supporting cast because I, I once I, I saw yours, I, I really didn't need to see anybody else. Um, <laughs> Cause I, I was just like, in my mind, of course, like I love the meta game of like, okay, you know, you and Michael Small would know each other and stuff, but the audition still had to be good. I wasn't gonna cast you, the audition wasn't good. And the audition was fantastic. Um, so I, I think um, though it, it is a, a, a single scene. Um, but it does have a lot to say. And, and, and so tell me about um, kind of what you brought to that role in terms of your thought process and preparation for it. Um, and, and what your, I guess, yeah, just, I guess just your process of like um, bringing so much power to such a brief uh, interaction. Um, well, I mean, it was great writing, first of all. I, you know, Thank you. I mean, it was really, like, even though it was a brief, moment it had a lot in it itself you know it's a whole i mean god watching people get killed like brothers and sisters getting killed and you know and some guys walking around going like oh big deal you know i mean that's that's enough to like get some good emotion from it um but so yeah i um i'm taking so i live in los angeles partially and i'm taking uh acting from Sally Kirkland, who uh won a golden globe in 1987 and was nominated for an oscar in 1987 for a movie called Anna. And that's the year that Cher won for Moonstruck. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, Sally, Sally should have won. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, but she, so she's uh, a big, a humongous, it's first of all, it's a dream come true. And she's super, super sweet. It's not like anything like crazy that I, like she's just like, you can literally like, like Facebook her and be like, are you, can you coach me? And like, she'll be like, come on over, you know, and she, you know, she charges you, but it's like, you know, so she just loves young actors and is yeah. really supportive. And she's a big member of the actor studio and stuff like that. So, um, and she taught at uh, Lee Strasberg School. So we have been working a lot on personalization uh, for me. So um, a lot of like uh, memory recall and um, emotional recall and things like that. So for that particular part, um, <laughs> we, so we went through a lot of like, we do this number thing with emotions. So like one, two, three is happy, four, five, six, sad, uh, seven, eight, nines, angry. And so when I got to the angry part, um, I there's one day that I really f f like let it out. And she's like, wow, she's like, you, you have some anger in you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, and, and a lot of it, and so a lot of it has to do with like my personal relationship, like with my 
family members, like my brother. So um, in that particular scene, I brought up all the stuff that my brother has done to me and used it to express the anger uh, towards Michael Smallwood's character. And then also my jealousy towards Michael Smallwood. <laughs> 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 so yeah and then then my other my friend i uh, was an actress in la edlin okano she um was she, she was coaching me for the audition and so she was helping me really pull it back a lot more than i had originally done it because i tend to be a little over dramatic i think a lot of times on film and she was really helping me like just kind of really pull it back and keep it like tight so fantastic yeah let me see if we got anything in the box there's nothing in the box oh uh, well i can i can sort of paraphrase what's in the box uh how has your response been to some of the fan art and some of the um interaction with the community oh my god i mean <laughs> <laughs> listen like i have never like i've been i've been doing this for a long time you know and like and a lot of it is like you know not you, you work and you, you're happy for the work, but you don't get a lot of like recognition, you know, and, and, and like, um, and so much rejection, you know, and it's like for people to like be so supportive of the movie and like the movie so much and just, and like, just my, I mean, the, my character that, you know, has a couple lines, you know, and people are drawing like fan art of it. I think it's so, it's amazing to me. It's, it's amazing. I'm like, it, like it, it brightens my day. I'm super grateful for it. I share it, you know. Um, I just think it's so cool. Someone, because I'm, I'm uh, fostering a little kitten right now, oh. and like, and I got some fan art with the kitten. And what? I, like, I haven't seen that. Oh, I'm not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like it's just so sweet. It's, uh, it's so nice because it's like you know, all my life I like you know. It's it's just nice. It's nice to have that kind of like just response to to something that I've done and and, and have people. You know, and 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 I want to like ultimately, like ultimately, ultimately, my goal as an actor is to, you know, be in something that helps bring out people from their normal daily life. You know, if they've had a bad day, they can watch a movie that I've been in, and I'll take them out of it. You know, and so to have people that that um, you know, appreciate it so much is this is awesome. Yeah, and as a director, um, it, it's the same. I mean, it's 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 very difficult as an indie filmmaker to be seen um and a lot of us you know we, we we make our movies and we put them on the festival circuit and then you know they get seen by maybe a thousand cumulative people over the course of a year at different screenings and stuff um a lot of those people are just the same people over and over again <laughs> and seen your movie five times at five screenings um, and then you know it might go to dvd or vod and and maybe another thousand people watch it in the rest of its lifetime and nobody ever talks about it again and that's reality for a lot of us um and I've been very grateful for the fact that, you know, Detroit Evolution is almost at half a million views and it's only been two months. And so that's like half a million people who've seen this movie we made. And, um, you know, uh, even if there wasn't fan art, even if there wasn't a community, just the sheer impact of like that people have actually like we, we, we made something that got seen and, and might be yeah. affecting and impacting somebody in some ways is really, really amazing. Um, I think it's so amazing for you. Like, it's just so great because like, when was, when was um, The Devil's Advocate? How long it ago was It was May that? 2016, so it was about four years ago, yeah, three weeks like ago. Four years ago, we were sort of like, yeah, I think I'm going to do this, you know? And it's like, look at you now. It's amazing. It's it's really funny to me that, um, that, that just like, this is how far we go back, that when I made Devil's Advocate, which is what I consider my first film, for those who don't know, it's on my YouTube channel if you want to check it out and see Michael act against uh, the amazing Kathleen O'Shaughnessy, both yeah. of them co-leads in that film. Um, it is a short three minute long, like shot in my kitchen. It was like one night, like over five hours or something. I didn't know you. I didn't know Kat. I just like, I, I got on Facebook. And I was like, does anybody know actors? And <laughs> somebody knew Kat cause Kat knows everybody. And, uh, and then Kat referred me to, uh, y'all's agent, uh, at Coast of Talent, who now is Maximilian's agent. And, uh, yeah you got into touch with me and you were like, yeah, like I'm, I'm a horror fan, you know, I'm an actor and stuff. And you, you fit the age range and stuff. Cause I was looking for like late thirties. Um, I was looking for casting older than myself at that time. And, um, and then I was also like, 
you're, you're not gonna get paid like I have Chick-fil-A or something like you know I just like I did, it's, it, I'm giving you dinner like I'm not giving you like anything and you're like it's fine it's fine it's whatever it's like one <laughs> night and uh and and then we got out together and like it it worked and I, I had no idea what I was doing I was so intimidated I was so afraid of offending y'all I was like I don't know how to talk to actors like I know don't give a line reading and that's it what other what other things do I not know like to tell them because I'm gonna like offend yeah. them so bad and, I'm, and then like every time I want to pull out something in performance i was like i don't know how to say like i can't just say like be angry like you're not supposed to say just like be emotion you're supposed to like give them motivation to do it, it was such a learning experience you're so patient with me and cat too um and uh and then that movie ended up um getting finished within a few days and we put it on the line immediately and it went to crimson it was the first film that uh got me into a film festival and mm -hmm. yeah, it just kind of didn't stop after that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think that you and Kat, um, having been so patient, giving me such a good experience for that first film, I don't know if I would be here right now if I had had like a bad experience on Devil's Advocate, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if I had had actors who were very temperamental, or if I had felt like I wasn't doing a good job, if I, if, if, if I had offended somebody in some way and felt like insecure about being a director, I might have put that aside forever. So I think that you're as responsible for why we are here today as anybody because you were kind and patient and did a good job. Gave me a good first movie. Oh, so sweet. It was fun. <laughs> Everybody crying in the club. <laughs> I saw a lot of people asking, uh, what's the deal with the rivalry? Oh, like what the source? I don't know if you want to go into that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think the long and the short of it is basically that Michael Smallwood is in Halloween. <laughs> I mean, that's really. Yeah, that's it. That's really it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Smallwood gets to be in a horror movie, like a like a like a Halloween, movie. not just a horror movie. Well, well, well like yeah, well, like uh, you know, one of the big five horror movie franchises, yeah, and um, and may get to do cons for the rest of his life as a, you know. I, I think you're making it worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, I, mean, I love Michael to death, and I'm so happy. God, I'm so happy for him, and he's a freaking phenomenal actor. So. Yeah. I'm stu I'm actually super excited to watch him in the next one. Like what he's talking about it, I'm just like <laughs> every time he talks about it, I'm just like I it's it's it it's surreal, but it is really, really um I, I'm I'm fascinated to see what they do with his character and what happens and, and how much he really sure. like and, and it's been people's response to it too, you know what I mean? Like seeing people yeah. outside of like our Detroit little corner, like people who are being exposed to him for the first. Okay, he's just staring at me like. <laughs> if, it, if you want to have something that you can sort of like hold, is uh, he got cinema sent for his line? He got cinema sent in the first Halloween, yes, because he he does have like he's kind of um, he's got lines, but he he's kind of blurry um, yeah. in in Halloween one, and um, you can recognize yes. his voice. And he and that his line got cinema sent, which is yeah, he said it was a, a bucket list item. <laughs> I saw that and I was like, mm. what a weird specific thing of, but y you know, one day, one day we'll get there. I, I one yeah. day, yeah, everybody should campaign to Jeremy to cinema sends Detroit Evolution. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, like Parker, just like where'd this guy come from? He just walked on screen, just like record scratch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but i'm super excited for him and it's always good to see like one of your, like a fellow actor like get something like oh shit that's like a that's a big one well and, and also it, it does make it like you know you did you did say like it's a lottery and stuff and, and it's like one in a million but when it hits close to home at least there's some semblance of like okay this isn't just like a mysterious thing that like happens to the brad pitts of the world if it can hip, happen to my friend like it could happen for me and if, if it could happen for like any of us, you know, we're all coming from the same place and the same agency and the same city and stuff. So I, I guess it almost yeah. makes it. Yeah. And again, like Michael, I like from, I don't, from Michael, I don't think it's the lottery thing. I think Michael has been busting his butt. You oh, know, absolutely. For, I have in a business, you know, so that's why I'm, that's why I'm truly so happy for him to see one of those people yeah. like that, like, 
you know, I've really been busting it. And like, and it's such a numbers game too. Like, it's like, you know, it's like how many auditions do I have to get for this casting director? You know, it's like, so when I have a casting director that auditions me a number of times, I'm like, okay, they want to cast me, but what are they going to put me in? Yeah. And so luckily with like David Gordon Green, he, I've auditioned for the first Halloween twice, I auditioned for this one Halloween. And then he, and then I almost booked a national commercial with him and like the company didn't want me, but it's like, I know that he wants to put me in something. So, so it's cool. Just like, I think Michael went through that. I think like, and then like, it was just like, bam, I got it. You know, and it's, oh, you broke, you broke through. Like, it's like, <laughs> oh, yes. You know? And I'll tell you, it's, as a director who, who casts people, um, it, it, it's so heartbreaking and inspiring at the same time, because it's like, you see so many good people. And, and there's been people like Marissa Rothfarb is one who's auditioned for me like three times. We love Marissa. Um, she, she's gonna be in something for me someday, uh, so help me God. But I just haven't found that right thing yet. And and we do know, we, we do find people we like and we just keep auditioning them. And I know it comes off as annoying to some actors. I know these actors are probably just like, God, why does she keep auditioning me? She just want me. Why am I always second, you know? But but it's yeah. because we see something. It's because we do actually see something and, and we're just trying to find the right time. We're just trying to find the right opportunity. And um, I always try to like mix it up with like people I've worked with before and who I know are great. And then people who I can bring on new, who I can give this opportunity to. Cause I think that's the most rewarding thing is to be able to introduce a person to an audience and be like, you, you know, you're a hardworking person, you're talented. You need that, like, you, you need to be given the door. You need to be given the foot in the door. And um, it's a really rewarding part of it. And and I and that's why when you were like, I want to be in Detroit, I want, I want to be in this Detroit stuff, I was like, I got to find something. Because you were there for me, you know, all the way back in my first movie, you know, Devil's Advocate and, mm -hmm. and Live Scream as well. And, and I wanted you to be an own, but there was just a scheduling conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I like to, you know, if I, I, I know a person is a good worker, if I know a person's talented, I know a person's good person deserves a break, you know, I want to reward that, um, you know, that friendship and that, that consistency and stuff and, and that hard work. Uh, I don't know if um, every director's like that. I know a lot of directors are kind of only in it, you know, for them, their own, they're, they're in their own like headspace, their own little bubble or whatever, but um, that's been a really cool part. Like, you know, Tyranny Breedlove, who starred in Ohm, she's one I keep just going back to in my mind. I'm like, I, I need to bring Tyranny back for some, but she was so talented, you know. Um, yeah, it's interesting, to, it's interesting to experience the casting situation from my side now with my movies. It's like, um, especially how I know how it feels. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh God, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you've you've actually had to you know audition people now and um and 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 you know how it is like that 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 so much of the time it's not personal right mm -hmm. it's just like oh, this yeah. you know this guy was really talented but he's just too young or this guy is really talented but he's, he's two inches too short he's too short you yeah. know like whatever it is just stuff they can't control that you know it doesn't mean that they're not talented or not not even that they're not right but there just might be somebody who's slightly more right. Or, or sometimes yeah. it's stupid stuff like this guy's in New York and this guy's local and he'd be cheaper. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I already bought the hundred and fifty dollar yeah. jacket. We can only, <laughs> you yeah. have to fit in it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I definitely experienced that a little bit with, um, with evolution as well. Like, especially in terms of location, because it was always like, well, then why are you going to do a nationwide casting call if you're going to cast local? And it's like because I can afford to cast like three people non-local, but I don't know who which right. three. So it's right. like nationwide, just come at me. And then, you know, I, I pick the ones, you know, non-locally that you just can't get around. And then everybody else you, you, you kind of adjust. So um, yeah, it's, it's, there's so many things that go into casting that are not personal in the slightest. At all, and, it's really. And, and I'm glad that you're feeling better about that. Cause I know that that's brought you a lot of angst over the years. <laughs> I've grown up some. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the 40 year old grown up. <laughs> it took a while. It took a while. Get out of the vodka. And grow up. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, yeah, it just, yeah, it's such a, it's such a business that you can't, you cannot look at yourself as a, it's, it just, it's such a business. Even with my agent I have now in LA, like I'm having to kind of like battle with that because Linda, who's my agent here, she's so personal. Like, she's so like, you know, if I have a good audition, she wants me to tell her. Well, I tell her, I don't know if she wants me to tell her. But, <laughs> but she's always super nice about it. And then my agent in LA, like I barely hear from them. But it's just because it's, it's I'm just basically just like, 
this guy is yeah. this guy. I can submit him. There's nothing personal. I got to just get him out, submit it, submit it to make money, make money, make money. You know, you just can't take it personal. So with five minutes left in your Q&A, um, <laughs> they were asking for, for some spilled tea earlier. <laughs> I don't know if you have any fun Hollywood stories that can be summed up in only five to six minutes. I, I know I know your favorite one, but that's like a 30 minute. That's a that's a long story. <laughs> if I can shorten it, though, real quick. Oh, well, if you want to if you want to if you if you want to take a crack at doing a five minute uh, version of uh, why, why we hate a certain daytime television host. <laughs> Uh, you go right ahead, because that's the, the most vindicating thing about that story to me is the fact that you told me that before it was cool to hate her. See, I, I, I just had to wait patiently. I had to wait patiently because it was all going to come out. <laughs> all right. The Cliff Notes edition and go. Okay. All right. <laughs> so uh, I worked for Ellen DeGeneres for about a week and a half. <laughs> and, um, uh, met her. I was working at a vet clinic. Met her uh, through the vet clinic because she was a client, and uh, I started medicating her cat at her house. And in that time, um, I told her I was looking for personal assistant work, and I needed to quit being a vet tech. I wasn't paying enough, and so uh, we had a really good time working together with her cat. And she said, um, "You know, I really feel connected to you. So I, you know, and if you want to be my personal assistant, I'd love to have you." And so I was like, "Okay." And she was like, um, "And don't worry about your apartment. You can just live at our guest house." I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I um, quit my job, started working for her. And um, to preface this to through this whole time, Ellen DeGeneres is like a hero of mine. Like I loved her in high school and I always thought in my head that I was gonna be friends with her. Like I just, I just knew I was gonna be friends with her. So like, this is like totally going in. I was like, I told you, I knew this was gonna happen. And so uh, she had three assistants at the time, her house one, her uh, show one, and then her personal one, who's this guy, Craig, who's been with her forever. And um, he usually does a hiring. And so she said, you know, I'm doing this outside of my main assistant, which I normally don't do. So anyway, so I started working for her. And long story short, uh, Craig pulled me out on like the, like the fifth day of it and fired me. And, um, and so it was pretty devastating. He didn't really have an excuse other than he just didn't think I had enough experience. And I, um, you know, was crying, driving on the whole drive. I pulled over in tears and, and uh, I quit my job and have a place to live. And Ellen called me and she was like, oh, what happened? And I was like, oh, Craig fired me. I didn't, you know, and she was like, why? And I was like, I don't know. He said, I didn't have enough experience, but I mean, I, you know, I didn't, really get to, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to show you what I could do. And she said, well, she, and she's like, oh, well, I have to really go by what he says. And I was like, okay, but I kind of like quit my job and I don't have a place to live. And, and she was like, well, we'll figure this out. We'll figure something out for you. Okay. And, and she was going to call me back and she never called me back. And I had to go pick up my paycheck. I wasn't allowed to go in the house. Craig just threw the check at me. It was awful, awful, awful. Never heard from her again. And, and <laughs> she didn't pay well. <laughs> well dollars an hour. <laughs> Even in like 1999, that's just bullshit. Yeah. I work for Debbie Gibson, who is 20 an hour. And she is not as famous as Ellen DeGeneres. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's funny now that, you know, you told that me that story a couple of years ago when we were first working on Fame Fatale. And now in the last year or so, there's so many Twitter threads now about how notoriously terrible it is to work for her. And yeah. and, 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 and now it's really coming out that, that it's an open secret. Uh, it's, it's escaped past Hollywood now. Yeah, it's and I've met people that have actually worked for her since then and like they're just like just be grateful you didn't work for her and then i told them when i told them the story they were like yeah that makes sense craig is really protective of alan he will cut anybody that is may threaten his job which that made me feel good i was because i was like well he should have been threatened <laughs> <laughs> we were going to be best friends <laughs> <laughs> i don't think our story's over i really don't think alan and my story is over interesting I, think, I really i don't i think there's i don't know it's it's not over <laughs> i've got some plans I feel, I feel <laughs> not like bad, not like scary bad plans. <laughs> not like I'm gonna like creep on her. No, I mean like, I know where she lives. <laughs> not like that. Like yeah. Oh my lord. Uh, well, the funny thing about that is like, would that just be another script where it's just like I'm a personal assistant who works for just this huge bitch and then ends up like setting her house on fire or something? Just, like, I don't know. Another revenge like fantasy about. <laughs> 
I don't know. I think I think Fan Fatale's enough for my bitter <laughs> script. You've got to put some version of her in that movie, some representation of of her. I don't know how, but we got to do it. We should do that. Actually, <laughs> as like one of like the things that go through my head of like past rejections. Oh God, the wig <laughs> alone. Yes, wouldn't be hard. <laughs> Mike lit the foot of Ellen's bed like. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. That's hysterical. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this lovely hour, Michael. It's wonderful to see you again. It's been a while. Um, and, and good luck with Wooft. I, I, please send me that script. I want to know how it ends. I got to know. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and let everybody know where they can find you on the interwebs. Um, uh, Michael James Daly on Facebook, um, Instagram. I am old and should know this. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> MJ Daly 930 on Instagram. Um, that is all I have right now. I don't do TikTok yet. It's really hard for people in their 40s. <laughs> it's hard for people in their 20s. I don't do, like, it's Chinese propaganda. I'm just like, mm, I, like, I... <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of dancey and like singing stuff. So I just haven't figured out what I want to do yet for it. So, and Twitter, I'm just, I, Twitter, I just, I'm not on either really. So, but I do post a lot on Facebook and Instagram. Word up. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, love. Uh, and, and everybody go follow Michael and give him some love and, and more fan art. 